This is our fifth session, and I thought it was going to be the final session on these verses in Philippians 4, 10 to 13, but there is one more question we'll be left with at the end. Father, as we look a fifth time and try to get at the root or the essence of what this secret is here, show us. It is yours to show, to work within us, and I pray for it, for the miracle. In Jesus' name, amen. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance... I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all these things, including hunger and being in need and being brought low. I can do all these things through him who strengthens me. It takes as much strength to hunger and need and be brought low as it does to abound and have plenty and abundance. Maybe it takes more to have abundance. And the four clues we've seen so far to the nature of this secret that we have to learn in order to enjoy this contentment is, number one, it said, it says, through him who strengthens me. So that's number one. Look to Christ. He's the one who does it. Number two. The very word contentment involving self-sufficiency means that when Christ works, he doesn't work in such a way that we cease to be involved. We experience this contentment. We fight for this contentment. And so the very word points to the secret or the mystery that it is Christ at work in us, and yet we are working. The third clue was the word learn. I have learned. And we saw that that word was used here in the preceding paragraph. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me practice these things. Paul had passed on crucial truth. And so the third key to contentment or the secret of being content in all these circumstances is that there are facts and truths to be learned. You can't have Christ-exalting contentment without Christ-exalting truth. And yet, fourth, we observed that the devil knows these truths. He has awareness of them, but he hates them. He doesn't believe them as precious. And so there must be a believing, an embracing, a treasuring of the truth, not just an awareness of the truth, which brings us now to today's question of a fifth pointer to what this secret is. And I said, the pointer is, what what do you have to learn in order to be content when abounding? What do you have to learn in order to be content when you are facing plenty? What do you have to learn in order to be content when you are experiencing plenty? abundance. There's a secret to be learned for how to be content in abounding and plenty and abundance. Pleasure, not pain, which raises a very interesting question. I think most people would say, well, you don't have to learn anything. That comes natural. The most natural thing in the world is to be happy and content and peaceful when all's going well, right? Well, no, not right. Because this contentment here is not worldly contentment. This is Christ-exalting contentment. This is contentment in Christ. I rejoiced in the Lord, in the Lord greatly. That's the kind of contentment. Or chapter 3, verse 1, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. Not just in circumstances, but in the Lord. 
Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evil workers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus. Our boasting and our exulting is in Christ Jesus. Or chapter 4, verse 4, rejoice in the Lord always. So no, no, the world does not know how to be content in all circumstances for the sake of Christ, for the glory of Christ in the Lord himself. So what has to be learned is, how do you rejoice in the Lord when the Lord himself has blessed you with abounding and abundance and plenty? How do you rejoice in the Lord and not in the abundance? How, do you, how are you content in the Lord and not in the plenty and in the abounding? That's the question that is raised. And when you read Philippians with that question in mind, the answer is clear. Let's look at two texts. Chapter 1. 20 to 23, it is my eager expectation and hope that I will not at all be ashamed, but that with full courage now, as always, Christ will be honored in my body, whether by life or by death, for to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. In other words, the reason to die is gain when I lose everything that this life offers and I lose it and I what? My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. The gain here in losing everything in this world is to be with Christ, which is far better. So the gain here is that Christ is better than everything in the world. So to live is Christ, that is to enjoy Christ. Or the other texts, this is the key one. I think if you were to say, is there one text, one text in the whole book of Philippians that points to the secret of the kind of contentment Paul is saying he enjoys, it would be this. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss. This is the secret. For the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I think that's it. The secret of Christ-exalting contentment in abundance and poverty, in pleasure and pain, the secret is seeing and savoring. Or if you want to use another word, treasuring. Or enjoying or being satisfied in. The secret is seeing and savoring, treasuring, enjoying, being satisfied in Christ himself as supremely. Valuable, and you get add words here, beautiful, great, all satisfying. That's the secret. Coming to a position where in your soul the world has lost its power to addict you to its pleasures because Christ is superior as a value, as a treasure, as a satisfaction, as an enjoyment, as a taste. Taste and see that the Lord is good. So, if we come back here, and we could ask, well, what about 419, where it says, my God will supply every need of yours. And we say, no, the secret is not in the promise that every financial need will be met, as precious as that is. But the fact that Christ is more precious than every need that might be met by way of finances. Or if we were to look at 2.14, where it says, if you're free from murmuring, you're a child of God. Isn't being a child of God the secret? Part of it. But ultimately, 
Why do you want to be a child of God? Because being in the family, you get Christ. Or what about 229, where if you risk your life for Christ, you get honor. Isn't honor something you'd want to be a part of the secret of contentment? The answer is part of it, but not mainly. The highest honor is Christ, to know Christ, to love Christ. What about 321, where we're going to get new bodies to be like his glorious body? Isn't that the secret to contentment? Yes, part of it. But ultimately, that new body is going to fit you to be around Christ in the new heavens and the new earth so that Christ is your supreme value. So I end where I said, this is the closest thing to the key in the whole book of what the secret of contentment is. The surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Nothing is more valuable than knowing Christ, seeing Christ, savoring Christ, being with Christ. He is the most beautiful person in the world, the strongest person in the world, the wisest person in the world, the most intelligent person in the world, the most loving and gracious and just person in the world. And we were made, our hearts were made, not for things, but for persons, and the person above all persons that satisfies the soul is Jesus Christ. I have learned, have you, have you learned the secret of being content in Christ because he is supremely valuable? So the last question for next time on this paragraph is, all right, what are the very practical steps I walk through to go here? <laughs> 